Hi, it's Kevin again. In the last video, which should have a link somewhere nearby, I discussed how to segment an image into individual objects using connected components. I ended the video with an algorithm to do it, but the algorithm is too slow to use in practice. In this video, I'll discuss the techniques by which we speed it up from being impracticably slow to being almost ideal. Good enough that a specialized algorithm to exploit the regularities of the pixel grid doesn't make sense. If you recall, the trouble with the simple algorithm that we started with was that the union operations we do among pairs of pixels built up a tree with many long slender branches. Then the find operations that we do to label the components need to follow the links up these branches repeatedly, resulting in an algorithm with big O of n squared running time. We need to reduce the amount of work that we do in traversing these chains over and over. The most obvious thing to try is path compression. When we run and find, keep track of the whole path that we use to get to the root of the tree and make every node along that path point directly to the root so that we'll never have to visit again. This is easily done with a recursive procedure shown here. The construction of the tree proceeds just as it did before. But now, each time we run find, we make every node we examine point directly to the root of its tree. We can do the bookkeeping with recursion as shown here, with auxiliary data keeping track of the updates to be made, or by temporarily reversing the parent links so that they point down the tree. This will reduce the worst case time to compute the labeling from big O of n squared to big O of n log n. The proof is somewhat intricate for this case, and I won't get into it here. It turns out that path compression actually does more work than necessary. We don't have to fix the whole path on every step. As long as we reduce the path length by a factor of two each time, we will get the same amortized performance. This gives us a new approach, path splitting. In path splitting, for every node that we visit, we'll make its parent point to whatever had previously been its grandparent. This will have the effect of splitting the path in two, with the odd-numbered nodes on one branch and the even-numbered nodes on the other. We've already seen the building of the tree. And we can watch find splitting the branches as it goes. This technique also gives us big O of n log n performance without needing to have a stack for recursion or maintain extra data about parent links that need updating. Even path splitting does no more work than necessary. Rather than adjusting every link, we can still cut the path length in half by adjusting every other link. This simplification gives rise to path halving. Each time we visit a node, we make it point to its grandparent, but then we visit the grandparent directly and don't trouble with adjusting the node's parent. We've already seen the building of the tree. And we can see that skipping half the links still halves the height of the tree, which is what we need to get big O of n log n performance.
All of these methods work by cleaning up the long chains in the tree. I can hear some of you shouting at the screen by now that we should just adjust union not to make messes in the first place. Yes, we can do that. Let's look at another improvement called union by rank. We maintain a field for each root called the rank. It's only ever set or examined for root nodes. The rank is always at least the height of the subtree. It can be more than the height of the subtree if we use one of the versions of find that collapses the tree. Since we always merge the lower ranking tree into the higher one, a tree of rank n always has at least two to the power n nodes. So the tree height and the cost of individual union and find operations scales as log n. Even with the naive find, we have n log n performance to insert n nodes and find all their representatives. Initially, we create singleton trees for A and B, and their rank is zero. Merging the two makes a rank one tree. A lot of merging of rank zero singleton trees into this rank one tree follows. With node F, we start accumulating another singleton tree and continue merging singletons into two rank one trees. When we finally merge the two subtrees that meet at node K, we hit our only promotion to rank two for these data. The merge of the largest pair of regions, which happens at node N, is combining a rank one with a rank two tree, so it doesn't add any height. After this, the find operations are all fast, since they go through only the shallow trays. It's notable that we can often avoid having extra storage for the rank field. It's meaningful only for the roots of the tree, whose parents are themselves. If we can, for instance, represent the parent link with a positive integer, we can represent the rank with a negative integer and keep it in the same field, as long as we're careful to check for this when getting the parent of a node. We can therefore run this algorithm on an image with working storage of only one integer per pixel. All by itself, even with the naive find, union by rank constrains the tree height effectively and gives us big O of n log n performance. For most combinatorial algorithms, big O of n log n is the holy grail of performance. But for this particular problem, we can go one step better still by combining union by rank with one of our improved find methods, such as path halving. You might think that perhaps combining the methods would yield no improvement, or guess that it might improve the performance to n log log n, since both path halving and union by rank improve n squared to n log n. But it's almost magical. The performance actually improves to n alpha of n, where alpha is the inverse of Ackermann's function. Ackermann's function is renowned for its depth of recursion and its explosive growth. It grows faster than any tower of exponentials. The inverse function therefore grows more slowly than log n, log log n, or indeed any iterated logarithm. To write the number n of nodes required for alpha of n to be greater than 4, one would need more digits than there are thought to be elementary particles in the observable universe. To all intents and purposes, it's a constant. So let's run the combined methods through without further comment and marvel at how the tree is almost perfectly clean throughout while doing only a nearly constant amount of work per union or find operation.
Now let's look at just one concrete example of union find, the maze problem. I'm not talking about solving a maze. There are techniques like Dijkstra's algorithm for that. I'm talking about the problem of building a random maze, perhaps as part of a game. We'll begin with some unchanging stuff. The maze will have outside walls, a central room, and a few little curvy passages. We'll put a hungry mouse outside and some tasty cheese at the center. We'll also build a wall everywhere that a wall might go. We'll define the maze by tearing walls down. We'll start with a union find data structure that will keep track of connected components of rooms. The algorithm is simple. We visit all the walls in random order. At each wall, we do the find operation on the rooms it divides. If the rooms are in the same component, we leave the wall standing, because if we tore it down, we'd create a loop in the path. If the rooms are in different components, we tear down the wall and unify the rooms. The first bunch of checks will usually union isolated rooms and merge them into pairs. Then we start encountering mergers that produce larger groups. We leave any wall standing that has the same component on both sides. If we were to remove the yellow wall, we'd introduce a cycle into a path through the maze. As we tear down more walls, we merge ever larger groups into one another. At the end, we're just cleaning up. Virtually all remaining walls connect the large component to itself and are simply left standing. Once we've visited all the walls, we have a maze that has a unique solution because we know that all the rooms are connected and that we never created a cycle by connecting a room to itself. This classical union find technique is pretty much the last word, indeed the last possible word, on union find on a serial processor. All the possible improvements involve going to parallel processing. For connected component labeling of images, it's helpful to recognize you can easily slice the images into as many tiles as you have cores, and then run connected components on each tile individually without any possibility of one core interfering with another. You can then stitch the tiles together in pairs using the classical algorithm, using first p over two cores, then p over four, and so on, where p is the number of processors. For more general union find problems on multi-cores, there are lock-free methods that use atomic operations such as compare and swap. These might gain a little bit more parallelism on the final stitching step, and are certainly needed for less structured data. There's also some recent published work on how to use massively parallel machines or graphical processing units to do connected component segmentation. They're really beyond the scope of this video, but I'll drop a few links down in the video description. We've now seen how we can use connected components to identify and label contiguous regions in an image. That's surely enough, for instance, that if for some reason we wanted to assign a label to each hole of a punched card image that we worked with in the previous series of videos, we could do so easily. To handle an image like the coins, though, we need some more tools because we need to deal with overlaps and near overlaps that keep us from splitting the coins cleanly. One of these that I'm planning to cover in the next video is called watershed segmentation from how it's related to the way that a cartographer maps the river basins in a mountain range. 
The particular variant of watershed segmentation that I plan to describe is due to Michael Schmid, who implemented it in the ImageJ software from National Institutes of Health. As far as I can tell, Schmidt never troubled to publish the technique, so all the information about it is in casual comments that he made on project mailing lists. Nevertheless, it's quite effective, and it's a widely implemented piece of the computing folklore. I'll be getting into some of the details of how it works, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep calculating. <laughs>